In the early 1800s, astronomers knew about so-called nebulae in the night sky, fuzzy extended objects that didn't move like comets. Charles Messier, the French comet hunter, catalogued several nebulae. For example, the 31st object in his catalog was then known as the Great Andromeda Nebula. Today, we know it as the Andromeda Galaxy, but in those days, all extended fuzzy objects were called nebulae. So what exactly is a nebula? In the 1800s, some astronomers thought that nebulae are a mix of stars and gases. Other people, including a wealthy Irish aristocrat named Lord Ross, thought that nebulae are stars only, with no gases. He hoped that better telescopes would be able to see all the stars. To test his idea, Lord Ross set out to build these better telescopes. He was a genuine aristocrat with a castle at Parsonstown in the centre of Ireland, and he and his labourers built all his telescopes in the castle grounds. So let's see what he built. Lord Ross's first big telescope was a Newtonian reflector with a main mirror that was 36 inches across. Bigger is better because larger mirrors collect more light for your eye, making fainter things easier to see. You can see the main mirror at the bottom of the big telescope tube. That mirror was built from scratch in the castle grounds using a metal alloy called speculum. Lord Ross even invented a steam-driven grinding machine to polish it. Light would come into the top of the tube and reflect off the main mirror on the bottom of the tube. The main mirror then focused the light on a secondary mirror near the top of the tube, where it would reflect 90 degrees into an eyepiece on the side. Lord Ross would stand in the wooden gallery and look into the eyepiece. The gallery could move up and down independently of the tube. If you look at the very bottom of the wooden frame supporting the telescope, you can see wheels on a circular track. Those allowed the whole telescope to be rotated. One of the nebulae that Lord Ross observed with the 36-inch telescope was M1, the first object in Messier's catalogue. Lord Ross thought that M1 looked like a crab, so he called it the Crab Nebula. Later telescopes would reveal that it actually doesn't look much like a crab, but the name stuck, and it's still known as the Crab Nebula today. Unfortunately, the 36-inch telescope wasn't able to resolve all nebulae into stars. Lord Ross needed a bigger telescope. His next telescope was so big that people called it the Leviathan of Parsonstown. It was completed in 1845 and was the biggest telescope in the world for over 50 years. Like the 36-inch telescope, it was a Newtonian reflector, but its speculum mirror was 72 inches across. Lord Ross actually made two 72-inch mirrors because the damp Irish air would make them tarnish quickly. With two, he could be polishing one while he used the other. The first one weighed three tons and the second weighed four. Here we see the cart and rail tracks used to move the mirrors. The stone walls on either side of the telescope were built to lie along the north-south line. The telescope tube was 56 feet long, including the box for the mirror. When directed to the south, the tube could be lowered until it was almost horizontal. Note how the lower gallery could slide both up and down and side to side, allowing Lord Ross to stand near the eyepiece. When directed to the north, the tube only had to rotate far enough to point at the North Star so that the telescope tube was parallel with the Earth's axis of rotation. The tube could also rotate from side to side, but not too much because of the walls. One could follow a star for about an hour as it moved across the night sky. Note how the top gallery could also move to be near the telescope. Lord Ross and his astronomer friends used the Leviathan to observe lots of nebulae. After a while, they became sure that every nebula was made up of stars and only stars. Not everyone was convinced, however. 
After all, not everyone had access to a Leviathan. The difference of opinion took until 1864 to be resolved. That's when William Huggins turned a spectroscope upon a nebula for the first time. He found solid evidence that some of the light came from a luminous gas, not a star. Modern images made by the Hubble Space Telescope have shown that the Orion Nebula contains stars, gases and new stars that have just formed from condensed gases. Although Lord Ross was wrong about all nebulae being stars, the Leviathan did help him make a completely unexpected discovery. In April of 1845, he pointed the Leviathan at the nebula M51 and found that it has a spiral structure. He had discovered a spiral galaxy. He didn't know it was a galaxy at the time, of course, so he called it a spiral nebula. Today, M51 is known as the Whirlpool Galaxy. The Leviathan would be used to unveil the spiral nature of several more galaxies, including the Pinwheel Galaxy and the Sunflower Galaxy. Nowadays, we know that even our own galaxy, the Milky Way, is a spiral galaxy. The story of Lord Ross's Leviathan is a great example of how science, initiated for a particular reason, can lead to unexpected discoveries even if the original reason turns out to be a hopeless quest. Today, you can visit a restored version of the Leviathan at Burr, the modern name for Parsonstown in Ireland. It has a new mirror made of aluminium. You can also see one of the original 72-inch speculum mirrors at the Science Museum London in England. The location of the second 72-inch mirror is a mystery. Production credits Feedback opportunities and more information are available from the signs near here. We hope you've enjoyed the tour and invite you to return. <laughs>